Good afternoon. Today, Alberta's government is announcing bold and targeted new measures to protect both lives and livelihoods by limiting the spread of COVID-19. This pandemic is a once in a century public health challenge and it has impacted every one of us in many different ways. I've received heartfelt and heartbreaking letters and emails from thousands of Albertans in recent days. I read out some of these letters to my colleagues during yesterday's incredibly challenging eight hour long meeting of the COVID cabinet committee. I did so to remind myself and all of us who carry the burden of leadership at this time of the profound human impact of this crisis and of our decisions. One letter came from a grieving individual who talked about the devastating loss of a parent who died in long-term care from COVID-19. Another email was from the owner of a fifth generation small business who I know in a rural town who is sick with anxiety that a lockdown could destroy her family's work for a century and with it their life savings. And another parent spoke of the anguish that they felt as they watched their children suffer increased anxiety over the virus and sadness that they hadn't visited with grandma or grandpa for months while they themselves couldn't see a clear path out of debt when the future of their job is unknown. Another spoke of her husband who had taken his own life as he faced the extreme stress, uncertainty and loss of the impacts of restrictions that we had in place this past spring. I also spent much of the weekend calling frontline healthcare workers to thank them, to listen to their experience and to seek their advice. Like the Calgary ICU nurse, a friend of mine who is exhausted after staffing an emergency ward near full capacity and an emergency doc whose hospital has no active COVID cases, but said that half of his patients are hurting from anxiety and depression due to the steady drumbeat of bad news and the impact of the COVID recession. I heard from an Edmonton surgeon who has said that his hospital here is coping well with COVID, but he's worried for his cardiac patients whose surgeries might be pushed back by months as a result of the pandemic. We are all so deeply grateful for the compassion and the professionalism of these and hundreds of uh, uh, rather thousands of medical staff across the province for things that they have been doing large and small. As Dr. Hinshaw has said, there is no one single way through this pandemic and any decision impacts the lives of our friends and our neighbors. Just 11 days ago, I told Albertans that we were at a dangerous juncture. We resisted calls for a lockdown of our society because the profound damage it would cause, especially for the poor and the vulnerable who are most affected by policies like that, by throwing hundreds of thousands of people out of work and deepening the mental health crisis while leaving many to despair. It would also, it would also be an unprecedented violation of fundamental constitutionally protected rights and freedoms. Instead, we, we focused, as we've done from the beginning, on targeted measures aimed at places where the data clearly showed that COVID-19 was spreading. The vast majority of Albertans have worked hard to abide by the restrictions announced on November the 12th and all of our guidelines, but the virus continues to spread. Its spread is picking up speed. Thank you to everyone, however, who has done their best. But as I say, we, we have all observed that Alberta has set daily records for new COVID-19 cases and more lives lost. Today, I am saddened to report that 16 more deaths have been experienced in Alberta related to COVID-19. And my heart goes out to their loved ones and to all of those grieving the 492 lives lost since March. Continuing care outbreaks have quadrupled since October the 1st, and they are putting the lives of our most vulnerable, our seniors, at risk. These are our grandparents, our aunts and uncles, our parents, friends and mentors. They've, they're the people who built our province. We need to do everything we can to protect them and to ensure they remain safe. And let me pause to say that yes, our policy is based partly on protecting the vulnerable, while minimizing damage to our broader social health. Uh, but 
we, to protect the vulnerable, we all have to do our part in limiting community spread. Because it doesn't matter, we could have the very best uh, systems in the world and great efforts by our nursing home operators to protect their patients. But inevitably, if there is widespread community transmission of this virus, it does and will get into nursing homes and other places where many of the vulnerable uh, elderly live. We must also protect our health system. This has been a long, hard year, but babies are still being born, thank God, and car accidents unfortunately still happen, and thousands of people are waiting for surgeries to be performed. And here is today's urgent reality. If we do not slow the sharp rise of both hospitalizations and ICU admissions, they will threaten our ability to continue delivering health services that we all rely on. This has already started. Edmonton Zone has already postponed many non-urgent surgeries. As cases continue to rise, other surgeries and services will have to be put on hold to make sure that we have the hospital beds and staff available to care for people with COVID and all other critically ill patients. And let me pause here for a second to say this. We have one of the best healthcare systems in the world. We have the best funded healthcare system in Canada. Canada has one of the best funded publicly administered healthcare systems on the face of the earth. We have one of the highest per capita numbers of physicians and nurses. We have tremendous hardworking professionals, world-class hospitals, equipment, and yet there are limits. We have 8,400 acute care beds. Uh, and we, we are working over uh, uh, night and day to increase capacity for the current and expected COVID surge. But as we increase that capacity, it comes at a real cost. A cost to people's health, and I fear a cost to people's lives. If we do not, uh, if we do not take the right measures, a growing number of Albertans will have to wait longer and longer for important surgery, many of them in pain and suffering. To be blunt, this will cost lives as well, reducing life expectancy. We cannot let that happen. And that is why I am declaring a state of public health emergency in Alberta. We are also announcing a series of targeted measures approved by the COVID Cabinet Committee based on recommendations from the Chief Medical Officer of Health. These mandatory measures will place new restrictions on social gatherings, worship services, businesses, schools, and all Albertans. Believe me, these steps are not being taken lightly, and I certainly didn't go into public service, nor did any of the people sitting around our Cabinet table in order to impose restrictions on how people live their lives. But we believe these are the minimum restrictions needed right now to safeguard our healthcare system while avoiding widespread damage to people's livelihoods. We are doing everything we can to meet, to strike that balance. The first set of restrictions will target social gatherings across the province. Let me just be absolutely clear about this. Social gatherings, are the biggest problem. Many people may think that a family dinner or get together with friends is, is no big deal, it's just normal. And you know, we don't imagine when we gather with family that people are gonna be transmitting a, a virus like this, but it is the key reason why COVID-19 is winning. These gatherings in the home continue to be the largest source of transmission, and so they must stop now. That's why effective immediately no indoor social gatherings will be permitted in any setting and outdoor social gatherings will be limited to a maximum of 10 people. Let me repeat, no indoor social gatherings will be permitted, period. We are limiting attendance as well at funeral and wed wedding ceremonies to no more than 10 in-person attendees and receptions will not be permitted. I know this is a terrible sacrifice for so many perhaps some of those who've been planning uh, weddings o o over the, the winter can, can think about perhaps rescheduling those uh, into the spring, hopefully after the positive effects of the uh, inoculation vaccine program. But for those grieving, uh, I know this is a particular uh, sacrifice 
to make, but we, we have learned here and around the world that weddings and funerals, given their intimate and emotional nature, are some of the largest causes for widespread tr spread transmission. It isn't, uh, this is not a preference, this is just a reality to which we are responding. This restriction applies across the province and it is mandatory. We will enforce it uh, and those who break, uh, we will enforce these rules against indoor social gatherings uh, and those who break these rules uh, will be subject to fines. We also look at ways, uh, we'll also look at ways, excuse me, to allow peace officers uh, to deliver fines for any, anyone violating these limits. An emergency alert will go out later this week on people's uh, smartphones to make sure that every Albertan is aware of these limits. We're also applying new limits to gatherings and places of worship. Our diverse faith communities have worked incredibly hard to limit the spread, and we know these settings are an important part of many people's lives, including their emotional, mental, and spiritual health. While the vast majority, the vast majority of faith communities have carefully followed our guidelines and experienced no known transmission, a handful have flagrantly violated these parameters, causing outbreaks. And that is why we are moving from recommendations to rules, capping attendance at one third of fire code while masking uh, is, is also required. To be clear, this will not affect the vast majority of faith communities who are already respecting, respecting the physical distancing guidelines, but it will make it clear that these are no longer just guidelines and that this is not optional. We believe this approach balances the charter protected fundamental right to freedom of religion with the public health imperative. These mandatory restrictions will be in place for three weeks and will be reevaluated uh, mid-December. Effective Friday, we are also implementing new temporary restrictions to limit the number of people coming into contact with each other at businesses and services. These restrictions fall under three categories. Uh, closed for in-person businesses, open with restrict restricted capacity, and thirdly, open by appointment only. Effective this Friday, we are temporarily closing certain businesses for in-person service in select regions. This includes the closure of banquet halls, conference centers, and concert uh, ven conference centers, excuse me, and uh, concert venues. It also impacts all levels of sport, uh, though leagues may apply for exemptions if they have well-developed COVID safety plans. Retail business, and let me pause there. Some people say sport is an important part of mental, obviously physical health, of course it is. But unfortunately, just in the last couple of weeks, we've seen nine outbreaks coming from uh, hockey games, uh, amateur hockey games that have been played in the province. This is, again, not our preference. This is just the reality uh, that we're dealing with. Retail businesses and services may remain open, but will be restrict restricted uh, to 25% of occupancy limits. In-person dining and bars, restaurants, pubs and cafes can continue, but we'll need to comply with our uh, guidelines very carefully. And those dining out must be limited to those who are in one household, uh, similar to the protocol in British Columbia. Finally, some businesses will be restricted to appointment only and must follow all public health guidance in place. This includes hair salons, personal wellness services, hotels, professional services and other businesses. I just want to pause there to say, you know, we've got to find little bits of positive developments and, and good news here. Uh, some of you may recall all of the uh, anxiety about reopening personal services in the spring, including hair salons. Well, we don't know of a single known case of transmission in a hair salon. And so that's, just let me say thank you to those operators, those workers for being so, so incredibly careful. Just a great example of the positive things that have happened as people have uh, uh, come together. We're also calling on all workers who can work from home to do so. I truly appreciate that many businesses have made major investments in creating safe workplaces. But the hard fact is this, transmission at offices continues to be a major uh, reason for spread. The government of Alberta will lead, by example, transitioning much of our office workforce to remote work in the days and weeks to come. These measures will be in place uh, for a minimum of three weeks and will be reevaluated as well in mid-December. 
as our chief medical officer has said, our school system has done very well at limiting in-school transmission. Parents, teachers and staff have worked incredibly hard to keep kids safe. Having said that, rising cases in our workplaces and homes, driven disproportionately by the social uh, gatherings, means that we are seeing rising cases in schools as well. There's very limited transmission within the schools, but more community transition uh, affecting the schools and their ability to operate. This has particularly uh, impacted staffing, which places challenges on the quality of learning that can be delivered. And that is why we are shifting some students to at-home learning uh, early before the holiday break. Uh, on November 30, all students in grades 7 through 12 will end in-person schooling for the balance of uh, 2020. And on December 18, all students will begin their winter breaks. In-person learning for all students will be delayed a week after the holiday until January the 11th to allow uh, kids who have been around family, for example, and perhaps friends over the holidays to have that, that uh, latency period before they go back to school. Teenagers are much more likely to transmit the virus than younger children. A longer period away from the school for these older students will help to reduce broader community transmission. By keeping younger kids in school will also help to make, to make it possible for parents uh, to continue to work uh, as well. Child care centers for preschool children will be able to operate within our safe guidelines and they too have done a great job uh, to prevent spread. Thank you to those uh, child care daycare operators and workers. Finally, since the beginning of the pandemic, we've said that when used properly, masks can play an important role in helping to limit the spread of COVID-19. They're not a silver bullet, nothing is, but it's one useful layer of protection. And there are now mountains of studies to, to confirm that. And so effective immediately, masks are mandatory for all indoor workplaces in Edmonton and Calgary and surrounding areas, what we call the Edmonton and Calgary health zones, where we see 83% of our cases. This will accompany the existing municipal masking bylaws in place in those communities. I know this is a lot of information, and in a, a couple of minutes, I'll invite Minister of Health Tyler Shander to outline each of these measures in more detail. Then we'll also hear from Dr. Hinshaw. These measures are tough, but they are necessary. They are needed to protect our health care system from being overwhelmed and to ensure that Albertans can access care for medical needs besides COVID-19. They are needed to protect the most vulnerable amongst us. They are also needed to protect Albertans from the health, social, and economic damage, damage that a crushing lockdown would inflict. We must not forget that every measure we put in place does make life harder for thousands of Albertans. Every new restriction makes it tougher for business owners to stay open and for thousands of people to pay their bills. Each new measure pushes you more people into debt and more f families closer to bankruptcy. All across Alberta, there are restaurants, hotels, retail business, and, and so many others. I call them the unsung heroes of our economy. So many of family-owned businesses where they throw everything, their life savings at risk to create opportunity to hire people. They need to know Albertans have their back. And so I encourage all Albertans to shop local and continue to support Alberta-based businesses wherever and whenever possible. These restrictions are not about uh, our preferences. They're not about politics. They're not about abstractions. They are about protecting both people's lives and the livelihoods that they depend on. This is the way forward for Alberta. And th that is the path that we are taking today. We're taking these measures now so that we have a chance to review where we're at before Christmas, which is so important to so many as a source of comfort and family. And here's the good news. Uh, we are all looking forward to a day when we have a rap, we have a widespread application of rapid testing and a vaccine readily available across the province. The end of this terrible time is in sight. Gosh knows we are all tired of this. COVID-19 is testing us, but we have risen to bigger cha challenges in the past. Now is the time for all of Albertans to meet the moment. The restrictions on gatherings, on businesses, on places of worship, 
will be evaluated after three weeks. If we see a significant drop in our new daily cases, we may be able to ease them. But let me be blunt. If these measures do not have meaningful impact, and that depends on how each one of us respond, we will be forced to take even more drastic measures to protect the health care system later in December. It is up to every one of us to do the right thing and abide by the new measures. That's the only way we reduce the spread and lift those measures as soon as possible. So let's all stand together and do our part. Thank you. And with that, I will uh, invite Minister Shandro to the podium. Thank you, Premier, and good afternoon, everyone. With, in light of the, um, um, the overview that Premier provided of the, the measures and the good reasons why we need to take further steps to contain the spread of COVID, I'll now go over each of the, the measures in more detail. And I also note that this information is also listed on alberta.ca. Effective immediately, no or indoor social gatherings will be permitted. Outdoor social gatherings will be permitted to a maximum of 10 people. Indoor social contact should be limited to those within a single household. Now, if you're someone who lives alone, you may have up to two non-household social contacts. The limit on indoor social gatherings does not apply to those providing home-based services such as healthcare or home care, childcare, and other services in a private residence. Funeral and wedding ceremonies must be limited to no more than 10 people and receptions will not be permitted. These gathering limits apply across the entire province. They'll stay in place until further notice and they're mandatory. Not following them could result in fines of $1,000 for ticketed offenses and up to $100,000 through the courts. We'll be using, as Premier said, the EAS, the Emergency Alert System, to ensure all Albertans are aware of these requirements. Now, turning to places of worship, in all regions under enhanced status, so in areas of the province where the community has 50 or more active cases per 100,000, places of worship are restricted to a maximum of one-third of normal in-person capacity, and masking will be required. As well, physical distancing between households must be maintained. In-person faith group meetings can continue, but attendees must maintain physical distancing and follow all public health measures. Turning to businesses, a number of new measures will take effect this Friday. And these measures are targeted at specific sectors to limit the spread of the virus, building on measures that are already in, in place here in Alberta. These restrictions fall, as Premier said, into three categories, closed, open with restrictions, and then the third, open by appointment only. In all regions under enhanced status, the following businesses are closed for in-person services. Banquet halls, conference centres, trade shows, concert venues and community centres. Children's play places and indoor playgrounds must also close. All levels of team and individual sport must stop until an exemption, or sorry, unless an exemption is approved by application to the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Hinshaw. So those are the restrictions for the businesses which fall into the closed category. Turning to businesses which may be open with restrictions, in areas under enhanced status, restaurants, bars, pubs and lounges, may stay open, but they must follow public health guidance, including the, the following four points. A maximum of six people per table from a single household, and no movement between tables. Second, if you live alone, you may dine with up to two other people as long as they're the same two people you've identified as your two close contacts. Third, only seated, uh, seated eating and drinking are allowed. And then last, no other services are allowed such as bar service or entertainment, including billiards, games, or darts. We're also extending the previously announced requirement to stop liquor service at 10 p.m. and for bars and restaurants to close at 11 p.m. We encourage Albertans to continue using takeout, delivery, drive through and curbside pickup wherever possible. 
We'll also be increasing inspections to verify that public health measures are being followed. Es establishments that do not comply may face fines and orders. Next, I'll go over the um, restrictions for retail businesses. Retail service businesses in areas under enhanced status may remain open at this time, but we are restricting capacity to 25% of their limit under the Alberta Fire Code, or a minimum of five customers, whichever is more. This includes entertainment and event services, such as movie theaters, libraries, museums, and galleries, and indoor entertainment like racing centers, bingo halls, water parks, and amusement parks. It also applies to fitness and recreation centers, pools and physical activity centers and facilities, including dance and yoga studios, martial arts, gymnastics, and private or public swimming pools. For these facilities, there can be no group fitness um, classes, training, team practices, or games. Facilities can be open for individual time uh, training or exercise only. And instructors can use a facility to broadcast virtual fitness classes from the facility, but there can be no group class. Casinos may remain open with slots only. Last call for liquor service is 10 p.m., same as restaurants and bars. And table games in casinos will not be allowed. Now, as I said, retail may, uh, uh, businesses may remain open, but are limited to 25% of their capacity under the Alberta Fire Code in the areas under enhanced status or a minimum of uh, five customers, whichever is uh, higher. This includes uh, grocery stores, pharmacies, clothing stores, computer and technology stores, hardware and automotive stores, and farmers markets, which are approved by Alberta Agriculture and Forestry. Now, outdoor seasonal markets like Christmas markets may also continue as long as public health measures are in place. And finally, the third category of restrictions for businesses for areas under enhanced status, we are limiting some businesses, as Premier said, to in-person services by appointment only. This means no walk-in services for hair salons, barbershops, aesthetics, or professional services. This also applies to hotels and motels, hunting and fishing lodges, and private one-on-one -on -one lessons such as music and personal training. No private group lessons will be permitted. And finally, doctors and other regulated health professionals can continue to care for the patients in person. As Premier noted, the point of these measures is to interrupt and slow the spread of the virus that we're seeing while still allowing businesses to work in ways which are safe throughout the province. Another key measure is masks. We've been one of the first jurisdictions to recognize the effectiveness of masks as use of masks can lower case rates. And so effective immediately, we are implementing a mandatory mask requirement for all indoor workplaces in Calgary and Edmonton and their surrounding communities. Masks should be worn in all indoor workplaces, except when alone in an office or a cubicle, safely distanced from others, or where uh, an appropriate barrier is in place. This includes any location where employees are present in person, and it applies to visitors, including delivery personnel and employees and contractors. It applies except in specific circumstances where masking can pose a safety risk to an employee. Let me also stress something Premier said. If you can work from home, you should work from home. Turning to education, after careful consideration, all students in grades 7 to 12 will move to at-home learning on November 30th. All other students will remain at school in person until December 18th. The winter break will be extended by a week of at-home learning, and then students will go back to school for in-person learning on January 11th, 2021. We're also announcing that diploma exams will be optional for the rest of the school year. Students and their parents can choose whether to write exams or receive an exemption for the April, June and August 2021 exam sessions. And just to confirm, there are no changes to mask requirements for students in school. 
I know that this is a lot of information and we, we will work hard to support businesses and other partners to help them understand and apply these measures and we appreciate their patience. As I mentioned before, all of these measures are laid out in detail at alberta.ca. In conclusion, I should note that we sh um, also continue to work on the other side of the issue and that's capacity in our hospitals, something Premier also talked about uh, this afternoon. In addition to the measures that we've um, announced today, we're continuing to work with AHS to identify ways to expand capacity and to support patients in hospital, especially those in, in ICU. We said some, from the start that the priority is to protect the health system here in Alberta and its capacity to provide the care that um, Albertans need. And that remains true today. I know that uh, people working in our hospitals are tired, they're putting themselves at risk, and they need our support. That, takes, uh, that support takes two forms. First, it's my commitment and the Premier's commitment that AHS will have all of the resources that they need to respond to the pandemic. And second, it means changing our behaviour here in Alberta to stop the spread of the virus and reduce the demands on hospitals and other health services. I believe these measures strike the right balance and that they will be effective. But we need to be clear, we can't order and restrict and enforce our way out of this pandemic. We need people to change their behaviour. So thank you and I will now invite Dr Hinshaw to provide today's COVID data update. Thank you, Minister, and good afternoon, everyone. In the last 24 hours, we have identified 1,105 new cases of COVID-19 in Alberta. Sorry, 1,115 new cases of COVID-19 in Alberta. While this number is a little lower than the past few days, this dip is due to fewer tests. About 13,500 were completed yesterday, compared to over 19,000 the day before. Our provincial positivity rate sits at about 8.3%. There are now 348 people in hospital with COVID-19, including 66 in ICU. There are currently active alerts or outbreaks in 318 schools, or about 13% of schools in Alberta. Currently, these schools have 1,135 active cases in total. There are 181 schools with outbreaks, including 65 currently on the watch list. Sadly, as you heard from the Premier, I must also report 16 new deaths from COVID-19 in Alberta. In the last two weeks alone, we have lost 103 people to COVID. 62 of these were in continuing care. 12 were linked to acute care outbreaks, and 29 were acquired in the community. Of the community-acquired cases, 14 were under the age of 70. This highlights that this infection can be deadly even for younger adults and underscores the importance of the measures announced today. As always, I extend my sympathies to all those who are grieving the loss of a loved one from any cause. Financial support programs are available for businesses impacted by restrictions, but there is nothing that can bring back a life that is lost. I also know that the pandemic's impact on hospitals is affecting our ability to care for Albertans' other health needs in the weeks and months ahead. The sooner we can bend the curve, slow the infection rate, and reduce the need for COVID-19 hospital care, the sooner we can rebook the surgeries that will mean an end to pain and suffering for other Albertans. We must take action now. The spread of the virus, the impact on our health system, and the challenges it poses to our health system are serious. I believe in Albertans. We are in this together, and we will get through this together. Thank you, and we are happy to take questions. In addition to Premier Kenny, Minister Shandro, and Dr. Hinshaw, we also have Education Minister Adriana Lagrange, Education Deputy Minister Andre Corbo, and Dr. Verna Yu, CEO of Alberta Health Services, available to answer questions. Please indicate who you are directing your question to. We have a lot of callers on the line today, so please be brief and limit yourself to one question. Operator, can you please put through the first caller? 
Our first question comes from David Staples of the Edmonton Journal. Your line is open. Uh, thank you, Premier. You mentioned that the end of this terrible time is in sight and mentioned both rapid testing and the vaccine. In terms of Alberta getting those two things, where are we with that? Is, is this something that Alberta's in charge of? Or are both those things more of a federal thing that we're dependent on them? Thank you, David. Yes, it's more the latter. We are dependent on the federal government. Uh, first of all, with respect to rapid testing, you may recall back in April, uh, I had some pretty sharp words for the slow approval pace of uh, Health Canada uh, on rapid tests and uh, had instructed uh, Alberta Health uh, to prepare for uh, the rollout of rapid tests that had been approved by the US FDA, the European uh, Food and Drug Administration, as well as their Australian counterpart. Um, but and I, you know, unfortunately, we can't bring in uh, imported tests that uh, without, of course, uh, you know, they can't get through customs unless the federal government has approved them. And we are um, disappointed that there has not been more expeditious approval. Why? I don't understand why we've not been able to meet the timelines of uh, of peer jurisdictions around the world. Having said that, we do appreciate that the federal government um, has used its purchasing power to acquire a large number of domestically produced rapid test systems. Uh, and we have uh, recently received 577,000 tests from the federal government, uh, 40,000 of which are the Abbott ID now molecular test, and 538,000 of which are the Abbott uh, pan bio antigen test um, and we will be making an announcement hopefully later this week about our uh, rollout uh, some of those are already at healthcare uh, facilities around the province but I'll be, we'll be making an announcement later this week about the complete rollout of those rapid tests and we're of course eager to get as many more as we possibly can with respect to uh, vaccines as you know we've we now have I think the third confirmation from with the, with the Oxford trial confirming 90% uh, plus effectiveness of their uh, vaccine trial. Um, we now have a, a three uh, major uh, vaccines that are moving towards uh, mass production and distribution. Um, the Government of Canada, uh, get, again, with the agreement of provinces and territories, uh, it, it has be, played the coordinating role in the acquisition of vaccines. And the reason for that is, I mean, even though Alberta Health has, a, as you know, a great uh, procurement system, when it comes to vaccines in this environment, it's a whole other ball game. And we are competing with basically every country in the world to get us uh, to the front of the queue. You need to maximize your buying power, buying for 38 million people, a lot more uh, meaningful uh, and faster access uh, to supply than buying for four and a half million people. So uh, we're counting on the federal government to come through uh, on that as quickly as possible. I've read some reports about this uh, today that are a bit concerning, uh, but um, we, um, we are working uh, with our uh, scientific advisory committee on Alberta's uh, protocols for uh, rolling out the vaccine for the priority cohorts for inoculation. Um, obviously, we would uh, most likely begin, and we're going to wait for the, the scientific advice, uh, but we would most likely begin with uh, healthcare workers and the most vulnerable, uh, such as frail uh, seniors living in congregate care facilities. Hopefully that, that answers your, your questions. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Our next question comes from James Keller of the Globe and Mail. Your line is open. Hi, this is a question for uh, both the Premier and Dr. Hinshaw. Alberta has had less stringent pandemic measures than other places in Canada. And we've also had some of the highest uh, rates of infection, hospitalizations in the country for several months. Um, is today's announcement an acknowledgement that that strategy has failed? And why are we doing what the Premier has described as the minimum that's required right now? Uh, so the answer is no. Uh, Alberta's response has been effective through uh, most of the uh, past nine months. We actually uh, led uh, large jurisdictions in Canada with, uh, I should say, we where the, had the lowest rate of transmission of the large population jurisdictions in Canada, lower than all 50 United States and lower than almost all European countries in terms of uh, active cases, uh, hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and COVID-related fatalities. Obviously, in the past few weeks, we've seen a significant increase uh, in the uh, in the new case count. Uh, 
And uh, what we've also done, though, through all of this is led in our response. Uh, we were the best prepared, I believe, in North America with respect to personal protective equipment. Uh, we have led in terms of testing. We had, we've had the most robust contact tracing system. Obviously, it's now uh, compromised because of the significant spike in cases, but uh, through um, eight of the past nine months, we've, I believe, had the strongest contact tracing. We were the first to develop a uh, wireless app uh, connected into contact tracing to support it, the first to develop an uh, online assessment tool. Um, and uh, so I, I think, th and we, we had much lower levels of uh, um, fatalities in nursing homes and long-term care facilities amongst the large population provinces. So those, all of those facts are to, uh, to the credit of Albertans for the responsibility that they've demonstrated. Obviously, like we see all across the Western world, uh, and a as was predictable in the fall, as the weather turns and people move indoors, uh, there is a significant spike in cases, and that's what we're addressing here today. And, and we've always said that we would address this as, uh, as the, the situation unfolded. You ask, why aren't we taking even more stringent measures? Uh, the, the answer is we are trying to bend down the curve. Alberta is not involved uh, in a chase after zero because, in our view, the, uh, the broader consequences for the health of our society would be uh, intolerable. Uh, to try to to try to get to zero with a widespread shutdown. I point to jurisdictions that promise circuit breakers for two weeks that three and four months later are still in unprecedented and extraordinary shutdowns of broader social and economic activity with massive uh, impacts on the health of those societies, on mental and emotional health, on physical health, on um, people's ability to uh, earn a living, uh, on, uh, and on so much more. Not to mention, by the way, <laughs> in so much of the debate, where, where have we forgotten about uh, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms? Since when should governments start with an impairment of fundamental charter-protected rights and freedoms, rather than uh, engage in such an impairment as a last and final resort? The, the Charter jurisprudence is very clear about this, that if governments are to Im, uh, impair uh, charter rights, it must be a minimal impairment to achieve a policy goal. So that too has informed uh, our approach. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Our next question comes from Dean Bennett of the Canadian Press. The line is open. Thanks. Uh, Premier, I suspect the, the, the decision you make to, uh, to restrict who comes into somebody's home was a very difficult one for you. I'm just wondering, how is it going to be enforced? Will we have, uh, you know, are, are we basically going to be asking Albertans to sort of, you know, drop a dime on their neighbor, or do we have teams going around, or how do you see this playing out? Thanks, Dean. Yes, a very difficult decision. I, I, I just never imagined I'd be in a place in public life where I was telling people who could come visit them at home. It's the, this whole thing is um, it just uh, incredibly uh, tough for for everyone, including those of us who are who are making decisions. We did, we really just felt we had no option, given that 40 percent of traceable cases connect back to uh, private social uh, activity. The answer on an enforcement is that uh, we no, we will not be setting up a so-called snitch line. I see some other jurisdictions have done that. Um, we will be expanding the uh, number of uh, enforcement officers who are designated to enforce public health orders under the Public Health Act. That will include, uh, well, we'll make a final decision later this week, but likely will include level one and level two peace officers. Um, and of course, uh, police are uh, empowered already to enforce those orders, uh, they will be able to uh, write tickets for fines of up to $1,000 per individual who's violating these rules for indoor, against indoor social activities. And um, I anticipate, um, it's of course for, up for the police and peace officers to operationalize this, but I anticipate that they uh, will be able to see if there are uh, ob obvious signs of a large gathering, a lot of cars parked outside somebody's house. Uh, for example, uh, we have seen similar problems in, uh, in other uh, parts of Canada. Um, I know specifically in the Peel region of Ontario and in the 
uh, Fraser Valley region of British Columbia. They've seen uh, similar challenges where notwithstanding the recommendations, there were large social gatherings. They did begin more uh, aggressive enforcement, and I think that has helped uh, to abate uh, large social indoor social gatherings uh, in those regions. So I would hope and expect uh, that um, Department of Justice and Solicitor General will work with Alberta Health and the police and peace officers on uh, learning how this has effectively been enforced in other parts of Canada. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Next question comes from Rick Bell of the Calgary Sun. Your line is open. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, just a question for the Premier following up on an earlier question about lockdowns, because uh, every time I dial in, there seems to be a lot of uh, clamoring for a lockdown. You've resisted that again, and you've stated your reasons, but perhaps you could say how bad, Premier, would it have to get for you to actually um, go to a sort of full-blown lockdown? Or are you just opposed to it no matter what? Or is there a circumstance you can see? And how bad would that circumstance have to be where you would go to something that's similar to what we see in other places like Manitoba, for instance, as an example? Obviously, we would like to do everything possible to avoid that because of the devastating impact it would have. And let me pause there to say that uh, even the World Health Organization uh, has recommended against lockdowns as a primary public health intervention and validated that the poor are those who are uh, punished most deeply by lockdown style policies. Uh, and and I, I wish people advocating that we go to that extreme at this point were a little more, I, I'm sure they'd advocate that in good faith, but I wish they were perhaps a little more transparent about what we know from the data on the broader social impact, particularly for the vulnerable. Uh, and so, uh, Rick, our, uh, uh, we are going to closely monitor the response to these new restrictions and guidelines. As I said, the key metric for us is uh, COVID uh, hospital patients, specifically uh, in intensive care, uh, as against the overall capacity of the healthcare system. Uh, right now, we have uh, 348 uh, COVID patients in hospital, of which 66 are in ICU. That's in a healthcare system with 8,400 acute care beds. In the spring, we were able to set aside, it wasn't easy, but we were able to set aside 2,300 uh, beds designated for COVID, including up to 650 in ICU. Just to give you a sense of the scale, we don't want to tempt fate by running to those numbers because uh, to open up that capacity means cancelling uh, surgeries and other non-urgent care. That's what's brought us to this moment, these decisions that we just announced, the effort to avoid widespread cancellations of surgeries and non-urgent care. Uh, that, to answer your question, Rick, that's the key metric that we are watching. So if we do not uh, start to bend the curve with this latest round of measures and greater effort by Albertans, let, let me be blunt, we will impose stricter measures, uh, likely in about three weeks' time. Uh, and uh, we will continue to assess it, but we're not going to let political pressure or ideological approaches to uh, cause indiscriminate damage to people's lives and livelihoods. We're going to protect the healthcare system using uh, targeted measures we will have to be more restrictive if they aren't, don't work. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? The next question comes from Lisa Johnson of the Edmonton Journal. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking my question. I'm wondering if you can uh, specify or outline what specifically those thresholds are. Is there that you mentioned the key metric is hospital capacity. Is there a point at which the province needs to bend the curve down to in order to say, okay, we can lift these measures, we're good to go for Christmas? 
Yeah, 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 very simply, I'll give you a very simple metric. In terms of the assessment that we'll be making on the 15th of December, uh, we need to see the uh, rate of transmission, uh, the R, uh, come down to below one. That's the absolutely de, de minimis, that's the minimum uh, me metric goal that we must achieve by December the 15th. We must see the rate of transmission uh, move below one. Uh, ideally, we, we'd like to see it get to 0.8%. But if we start to move it below one, then we, we know that uh, we've, we begin, we've begun effectively to bend the curve. And right now, um, uh, we are at, uh, I believe, Doctor, about 1.3 in Edmonton and 1.1 something in Calgary. Is that, would you like to supplement that? You're giving, oh, or I, I don't mean to inconvenience you. It's about that. Yeah, it's about that. I, I've got a, a validation on that. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Our next question comes from Bill Fortier of CTV News. Your line is open. Bill, are you there? Uh, hi. This, uh, yeah, sorry. This, this is uh, for the Premier. Um, just, um, and, and I apologize if it's been asked, but, you know, to say there's no indoor social gathering, but, but restaurants are still open at 25% capacity, you know, a lot of people would say, how is that not an indoor gathering? And also, you know, with this letter from hundreds of doctors, uh, from Alberta saying that a shutdown of these, uh, of these restaurants and bars is necessary. Uh, how, how do you reconcile not doing that? So, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, no, uh, we've been very careful to say that uh, in the future now, service at uh, bars, uh, restaurants and pubs must be to a family cohort. Uh, if you're a single person, that can include your two designated close contacts. Uh, this is the same principle that's informed the public health policy in British Columbia, uh, which is experiencing a, a spike similar to ours. Uh, so uh, the f family eating at home versus a family eating out, uh, it's not a social gathering, it's a family eating together, it's a family cohort eating together. Um, and uh, quite frankly, our data is clear that the risk of transmission in a structured restaurant environment is significantly lower than the risk of transmission at an at-home social function. So uh, the reality is that um, while we have seen uh, uh, some people who work in the hospitality sector test positive, of course, uh, my recollection is that the last data I've seen, we identified 18 uh, outbreaks uh, over the past nine months in Alberta's 13,000 hospitality businesses, meaning that uh, something like 99.8% of those businesses did not have outbreaks. And uh, prior to the uh, uh, challenges with our contract tracing system that started about three weeks ago, we had to that point identified um, uh, about 0.7% of, of confirmed uh, cases of transmission having occurred in businesses of that nature. Uh, so that's in part what I would say uh, to those who have demanded the closure of those places. I, I will repeat, I believe that um, people who are recommending uh, so-called lockdown policies, are, I'm sure, are doing so in good faith and that they are well-intentioned. Uh, let me, however, say this. Um, I uh, would ask people who have the certainty of a paycheck, particularly a government paycheck, to think for a moment about those individuals whose entire life savings are tied up in businesses such as that. I would ask them to think about the, uh, the, 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 the 175,000 people who work in that industry, disproportionately women, I would, I would ask them to think about the impact on those lives. I, I would ask them to think uh, about the data from the Canadian Federation of Independent Business and Restaurants Canada, which indicates that based on surveys, as many as 40% of our 13,000 restaurants and hospitality businesses might not be able to survive a second shutdown. So uh, I, I think it, in, in, for some, Perhaps it's, it's a little bit easy to say, just flick a switch, shut them down. But, you know, I can tell you, 
couple of weeks ago, I was in my constituency at a kind of uh, little uh, food court thing, and a uh, new Albertan, a refugee from uh, Venezuelan socialism, came up to me. She had just opened a little food kiosk. She, saw, she, she recognized me. She came up to me, and she broke down in tears in front of me, saying, sir, I, I've put my entire life savings as a refugee into this little business. I've just opened. We're struggling to pay the bills. If you shut me down, I'm going to lose it all, everything, and I'll be in po abject poverty. So you tell me what the, the, the health consequences are for that woman and her family. So I, I think we need to be a, a little more balanced in the way that we discuss these things. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Our next question comes from Lisa Corbella of Post Media. Your line is open. Oh, uh, hi, Premier. I'm just wondering, um, this uh, restriction on stores, having not being able to have um, more than 25% of their capacity with shoppers just before Christmas. Um, my understanding is that stores have not been a significant cause of spread of COVID-19. So I'm wondering how you arrived at this 25% and, um, and how is that different from way of where we stand currently? Sure. Thanks, Alicia. Uh, first of all, this, is, this compares to several other provinces that have effectively completely shut retail designating retail, uh, with the exception of grocery and box stores, as, quotes non-essential. Let me say something. Uh, we need to acknowledge, as we go through COVID, when we have made mistakes. This government made, I think, a grave mistake in the spring when we made, frankly, I think a stupidly arbitrary distinction between essential and non-essential retail businesses that had the unintended consequence of allowing Walmarts and Costco's to sell darn near everything because they have a grocery section or they sell pharmaceuticals, while shutting down thousands and thousands of retail uh, small and medium-sized businesses. I, I, you know, I, I talked about the, the fifth, genera fifth generation family in my remarks with this, uh, uh, running a store in rural Alberta. 100% of their business went to the big uh, U.S.-owned box store down the street, or of course online, for 10 weeks because of that, frankly, stupid mistake that we made, for which I, I apologize. Uh, we tried to undo that as, as quickly as we saw the, the, the realized it and, and saw the impact, but we are not doing that now, unlike other provinces that have done that. And uh, we are putting a capacity limit because we have to do some things to limit general social and community transmission. You're right, we have not seen, I'll let Dr. Hinshaw speak to the statistics, we have seen some spread in retail settings, but it's fair to say that it's been a small fraction of social gatherings. Um, I was speaking to the CEO of uh, one of the country's largest retailers the other day uh, who said that her company has 4,000 uh, retail employees and they are closely tracking this. They've been very careful, uh, COVID safe, and they have had only six, six of their uh, 4,000 employees test uh, positive. That is great credit to that company and, and reflective of, of so many others in the retail sector. It's why we feel confident with, with uh, allowing them to continue to operate safely while avoiding crowds, uh, and, and that's really what this is an effort to do. Many uh, businesses, Lisa, are already doing that. Um, I, I know in my own neighborhood, I see people uh, queued up, especially on the weekends, out, outside of, of popular uh, stores, specialty small businesses. Um, you remember in the spring, uh, that was happening a lot more at grocery stores, for example. Uh, how, your, part of your question was, how did we arrive at this number? Um, Look, we took on board public health advice, which of course is, is to try to do everything possible to limit social contact and spread. We also uh, spoke to the uh, Retail Council of Canada and to some of the uh, you know, different, different retail companies to see what would be an, a, 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 an effective number. Because one thing we didn't want was the unintended consequence of, of huge outdoor queues in the winter 
You don't want people waiting for 90 minutes to get their groceries when it's 25 below. So we, we, we've come to the conclusion that this is uh, a, a decent number that allows the safe functioning of those businesses. Um, it, it may mean they, the, some of them will want to extend hours um, and encourage people to come in slow hours and so forth. So I, I'm sure that our innovative Alberta entrepreneurs will figure out how to work within those parameters. Okay, we have time for three more. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? The next question comes from Julia Wong of Global News. Your line is open. Hi, this is for the Premier and for Dr. Hinshaw. We often hear about the use of data to make the decisions, but there have been challenges with data due to contact tracing issues. The majority of new cases have unknown sources, so there isn't much data there, and different places have different public health measures, so it seems like straight comparisons with other jurisdictions are tricky. What specific data and evidence did you look at that shows these measures will be effective, and will those be made available to Albertans? Well, first of all, Julia, we, we do have data. We have eight months of contact tracing data of the most robust contact tracing system in Canada based on the most robust testing system in Canada. And so uh, we can, it's true that right now um, we are only able to uh, trace a small percentage of new infections, but it, it's reasonable to draw inferences from the patterns of infection that we've seen over the previous eight months. So looking at, at, at that, looking at outbreak data, we, we've uh, obviously identify uh, outbreaks and that helps to inform um, policy as well. Uh, the healthcare utilization data informs policy, the number of ICU beds, the uh, case to hospitalization ratio, the case fatality ratio, the inferred infection fatality ratio. Um, all of these are, are relevant data points that we draw upon in developing this policy. Now, it's true that in some areas, uh, in some areas, uh, we have to use a bit of intuition as well um, about what our, our and, and, and this is based as well on data from, not intuition, but, but general learnings from studies and experience through the COVID period all around the world. So we, uh, I know that uh, the, the Chief Medical Officer's team is constantly reading new literature on what constitute high vectors of transmission, for example, uh, in other jurisdictions. So we look at that global data, we look at the academic research, we look at our own experience, we, looked at, we look at our contact tracing data, and all of those other factors uh, all together. But we have to, you know, this is not a simple mathematical scientific exercise, there is a, a balancing function here as well. And that's what our, uh, ultimately our uh, COVID cabinet committee is responsible for. We have to go through the, very, this is why we spent it, had an eight hour meeting yesterday to take on board data, public health advice, weigh that against unintended consequences, broader social and economic consequences, uh, the willingness of Albertans to comply and all of those other factors, some of which are, um, um, are, are challenging to measure. Did, is that okay? Do you want to add anything? She, I think. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Our next question comes from Don Braid of the Calgary Herald. Your line is open. Hey, Mayor. Um, you did have a eight-hour meeting yesterday, uh, which showed, I guess, the complexity and difficulty of all this, but at the end of it, after getting, I uh, presume, a series of recommendations from Dr. Hinshaw at the beginning, you come out with what you come out with, which may or not be the same thing. My question is, are you confident at this stage that uh, the measures that you're bringing in now, if the compliance is, is what it should be, will get you where you want to be by the 15th of December, which is a, a transmission rate of uh, an infection rate of below one. It's, it's really kind of important that this actually work in the, in the macro scale uh, before you get to the point of actually wanting to go to a lockdown. Are you confident that what you've got now can get you to that transmission level? Uh, yes, that's why we've made these decisions. Uh, and it, it's not, like I just said, it, it's incredibly challenging to balance off all of these broader health concerns and, and uh, uh, imperatives, the human consequences and all of it. We think these are very, uh, look, Don, just to put this in perspective, 
uh, for the first time in the history of our province, we've just told people they're not allowed to have anybody over to their homes and they're going to be fined if they do. These are extraordinary. I think in the COVID era, we've it, in some ways lost perspective, throwing around extraordinary exercise of government power, state authority that are uh, unprecedented. And um, no, we're not trigger happy to do that. We're careful and deliberate. And I just hope profoundly that th this, today's uh, measures will, will send that message to that portion of the public that has been not part of the, the process here. They've been opting out or ignoring it. They're just tired or, or fatigued of it. Or they, they, they're, and, and, and by the way, I, I've, I've said this before, we're not expecting everybody to be perfect in their kind of COVID performance here. Everybody's going to slip up from, that, from time to time, uh, not follow all the rules perfectly. Um, and, and this is a freedom-loving province. I, I get all of that. But this is really clear, the message we're sending today, which is uh, uh, if you're holding uh, indoor social events, they're now illegal. That's pretty astonishing. And, they, and those rules will be enforced to, to our greatest ability. Uh, and we're also saying if you can work from home, please do so. So uh, we're going to give this uh, every effort. And as I say, uh, if we don't get that uh, rate of transmission down, uh, start bending the curve, we will have no option uh, but, uh, but tougher measures that we do not want to impose. But at the end of the day, and, and let me just, I'm going to close this off. I, I can predict right now, I don't even need to look at it, that on my Facebook page there are thousands of very angry people um, saying that this is a, a lockdown. First of all, it's not. To those folks, I say this. Uh, this is not an abstraction. If you know somebody waiting for surgery, someone in your family, a friend or neighbor, who's waiting for ca cardiac surgery or heart surgery. This is about them. It's not about uh, our political preferences. I wouldn't be standing here announcing these things uh, out of any political preference, personal preference. This is about those people and whether or not they will be able to get access to critical health care and to surgery in a reasonable amount of time. That's all this is about. Because if they don't get access in a reasonable amount of time, you'll have a growing number of people suffering, anxious, depressed by, let's not forget that much of the opioid crisis in this province started with people being prescribed opioids because they were waiting on surgical wait lists. This has huge downstream consequences. And so I say to people who are upset about these kinds of restrictions, I'm upset with them too. That's why we spent eight hours grappling with this yesterday. But I say to those who are upset, it's not good enough to complain. You tell us, how are we going to ensure timely access to health services for people who need them if the hospitals get crowded out with a growing number of COVID patients? If there's somebody with... Uh, with a way of doing that, without any restrictions, I'd like to know what it is. Because God knows we've been searching for that. So I would just say to those folks, I get your, your frustration that we're all going through this, but please think about those people who need that health care. That surely should be our common social goal right now. Operator, can you please put through the last caller? Our final question for... Today is Stephanie Rousseau of Radio Canada. Your line is open. Bonjour, ma question est pour le Premier ministre. Um, Monsieur Kenny, pourquoi ne pas imposer un confinement complet comme le réclament plusieurs médecins là, qui s'inquiètent des dangers pour les hôpitaux? Et si je peux me permettre une deuxième question aussi sur votre gestion de la pandémie, il y a plusieurs qui vous reprochent en fait le fait de ne pas avoir été plus présent sur la scène publique alors qu'ils s'inquiétaient du nombre de cas qui augmentaient. 
pourquoi avoir fait ce choix-là et est-ce que vous prévoyez être un petit peu plus présent là, au cours des prochaines semaines? Sur la deuxième question, comme vous savez, j'étais euh, en isolation la semaine dernière parce que j'étais un, un contact euh, euh, proche de quelqu'un qui était positif. Euh, et euh, deuxièmement, je me souviens dans le printemps, que les mêmes critiques ont dit que j'étais trop présent, que j'étais trop impliqué dans les annonces comme euh, celui d'aujourd'hui. Alors, il y a des critiques qui, qui euh, euh, vont me critiquer pour n'importe quelle raison. Euh, J'ignore tout ça. Je, je suis focusé sur euh, la santé publique euh, et euh, la sécurité euh, sociale et pas, pas de, de, ces gammes, de ces jeux politiques. Sur la première question, euh, écoutez, même l'organisme globa global du, de santé a dit que les fermetures de la société n'est pas une réponse politique préférable parce qu'il y a uh, énormément des, uh, de, 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 des, des effets négatifs avec ces fermetures sociales, particulièrement pour les pauvres et les vulnérables. Ça, c'est l'avis de l'Organisme global de santé. Et il faut que nous autres, comme gouvernement, euh, équilibrent l'impératif de santé publique avec, en ce qui concerne le COVID-19, avec toutes les autres questions de santé de notre société, la santé mentale, émotionnelle et physique des chômeurs, des propriétaires des petites entreprises. Pour ceux qui reçoivent les chèques stables du gouvernement à dire « fermer toutes ces petites entreprises » et jeter centaines de milliers de travailleurs au chômage, imaginez-vous l'impact total sur la vie de ces personnes, la pauvreté que ça va créer. Alors, on est prêt. Si c'est absolument nécessaire de, de, à prendre les mesures supplémentaires, mais à commencer avec tout ça sera, d'après moi, irresponsable. Et finalement, il faut dire, qu'est-ce qu'il est arrivé avec le focus de ce pays sur le charte des droits et libertés, avec la protection des droits fondamentaux? Si un gouvernement... Doit, euh, doit agir d'une façon qui, qui diminue les droits constitutionnels. Il faut le faire comme une dernière étape, pas une première étape. Et euh, cette approche-là a, a visé notre politique. That concludes today's Q&A. Thanks very much, everyone.